Should we be off mute? Oh, you could be on mute for now until uh, I'm going to introduce all of you when we get there. All right, welcome everybody. We're just gonna wait one more minute and uh, begin shortly. All right, welcome. I think we'll get started. Um, thank you for taking time, time to be here with us in the third event of a five-part series called Breaking uh, Barriers Through Brave Conversations. Uh, we did two events, one around being Muslim, one around being Black, and today we're focusing on uh, the lived experience of being female in the world of basketball in Canada. We have an all-star uh, cast and crew of panelists, which we will hear from shortly. Uh, range of uh, wealth of experiences and look forward to hearing um, them uh, and shared experience and knowledge with us. So we'll get started to maximize our time and to have ample time for Q&A at the end. So we ask to hold your questions. We'll have the chat going. So feel free to um, put your questions into the chat. Um, otherwise, um, please wait till the end. So we'll start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, I'm joining you from Toronto. Uh, the objective of the BBB series, kind of the why behind it, I think today's focus is on sexism and gender inequities as a systemic institutional problem. And, um, and then we'll have a dialogue and a conversations with our panelists who are players, coaches, officials, or wear more than one hat given their trajectory and their careers. And at the end, we'll talk about resources and Q&A. And if you've pre-registered, we'll send you the recording by the end of the week along with those resources. So you don't need to take notes. Um, so the land acknowledgement is important, of course, uh, with the finding of the bodies across different provinces. It's definitely a moment to reflect and think about what we can do. So it's not performative and it's action oriented. I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging that the land we're meeting on is a traditional territory to many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Today, the meeting place of Toronto, where I'm uh, coming virtually from, is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and in this territory and remotely as well. Um, Whose Land is a great app if you never come across it to check it out wherever you are across Canada. It gives you lots of great information using GIS technologies. I suggest you check that out. Um, the whole series is kind of, um, you know, there is no such thing as a safe space. So uh, we want to have brave space where we talk about how we're willing to be vulnerable, how we're trying to take risks. And in this process of being vulnerable and taking risks, we can challenge injustice. Because if we always stay in our safe zone and our safe space, um, we sometimes will be complicit and conform. So we need to reach that um, stage of uh, having brave conversations, which kind of creates the synergy to tackle some of these systemic issues. I'm going to skip reading the poem, but it is something we've been doing uh, at the start of each series. And I encourage you to check it out by a poem by Mickey Scott Bay Jones, which talks about what it means to be brave. I just paraphrased it. Um, and, you know, remember, you're, uh, we all come into this topic from different uh, vantage points, positionalities levels of privilege and oppression. So you might feel uncomfortable and maybe something I see or the palace say might rub you the wrong way or make you upset and angry and that's okay. What's important is to think about why you feel that way. Uh, what is it rooted in? What does it represent? And whether you're experiencing others, how can it help you better understand an issue from different perspectives? So um, this is all part of the challenge and the emotional and what we call a spiritual labor of unlearning, referring to the works of Bell Hooks and the goal of making sports and its culture more equitable, diverse, and inclusive, because there's always room for improvement. 
So we'll start with a couple of pieces to set the stage before we introduce our guests. I mean, the event title is called Being Female, but and sports is played by gender, men, women, girls, boys. But we have to keep in mind that that itself is not inclusive and it's a binary. Not everybody goes by those pronouns. So it's important to reflect on um, self-identification because language matters and that's a starting point. Um, so not everyone self-identifies in those binaries. So think about even when you're coaching or playing or you know, you're in a leadership role in the community, some of you are educators, uh, some of you are involved in different ways um, with children, is the language used personally and in your organization inclusive? So, you know, when I teach classes, you know, I've had to reflect and I use more inclusive words like, you know, good morning, everyone, good afternoon, everyone, hi folks, not good morning, ladies and gentlemen, you know, boys and girls, right? So try, you wanna shift away from that binary use of pronouns. Um, and then is training available for people in your organization to be educated about these things, right? And that's important. So, you know, I use the term binary, which is kind of like A or B. So we want to shift towards using non-binary language. And these are some of the terminologies that you want to become more comfortable with. So you are using more um, inclusive language, you know. Things like gender fluid is a person who embraces fluidity of gender identity, right? Being agender, one who does not want to identify as a particular gender, right? So I'm not going to go through these, but this is a starting point, and I encourage you to um, search some of these. But non-binary is an umbrella term for a person who identifies with or expresses a gender identity that is neither entirely male nor entirely female. So keep that in mind, even though sports itself continues to be played um, by gender, uh, how do you create an inclusive environment within those spaces so people feel like they belong and don't stop playing sports? Um, that brings us up to this slide, which kind of want to talk about why it's a systemic issue and how, why we need to disrupt gender stereotypes and inequities, which are rooted in binary thinking. If you think about, you know, when babies are born, what do parents want to know? often if it's a boy or a girl. So this construction of gender starts before birth, right? You wanna think about how you wanna paint the, the room, what color, what, what toys to get them, right? So we start having these traditional gender stereotypes and I'm sure a lot of our panelists, we will speak about some of these negative stereotypes or assumptions made about you, but to give you some um, examples from professional sports, here are some uh, recent examples. You know, in 2015, Chris Paul criticized Lauren Holt Kim Sterling, calling her judgments ridiculous and questioning her career choice, being one of the very few uh, full-time female officials in the NBA. You know, we can fast forward to 2021. Um, this received a lot of media attention. You know, differences in the men's and women's weight rooms in the NCAA bubble. You know, that was quite disgusting, right? Uh, the, and such a wide difference. Um, I'm going to share with you one of our panelists, uh, amazing and inspirational poem, Natalie Chen was Mad Love Poem. And we can also think about pay gaps, um, disparities in TV coverage, even though it's getting better slowly, there's still a lot of room to go and many more. And then I'll wrap up with a slide with some statistics and then we'll get, introduce our guests. So I'm gonna show you the video now. So here we go. It's hard when they tell you who you can be. The sky is the limit, just wait and you'll see. So I eagerly run to turn on the TV only to find out none of these athletes look like me. All the sports channels are showing highlights and lowlights of every sport you can think of, except the one every night that I dream of. Like being fourth in the world is an easy feat. Like we don't show up every single summer without missing a beat. All I ask is for us to get a fair shot, maybe swap out that rerun during the 7 p.m. slot. It has never been said that equal means we are the same. We just want a fair shot at our own fame. We want nothing more than what we deserve, a chance to inspire that next little girl. Instead of growing up with comments like get back in the kitchen or having to coward and hide in submission, instead, she can stand with her head held high, 
knowing she doesn't have to aspire to hoop like some guy. When she turns on the TV, she can learn to be shifty like Maya Marie. Our faces and names should be known, like the Tatums, homegrown, Brampton's very own. For the resilience, strength, and how we have grown, we deserve all the flowers and the love to be shown. I will always keep it real and give you the facts. Just like these young kids say, I promise no cap. I know a couple women who would give you the biz. Try Kia, Murr, Kim, or Liz. And listen, I swear I can do this all day because the next generation is also storming this way. And if at some point I lost you along the way, I'll remind you the message, just repeat what I say. Bet on women, invest in women, protect women, respect women. And I promise not to bore you ever again if you promise to provide equal representation because no one needs a poem, a song, or a revelation. Just put women's sports on the damn television. Mad love, Natalie Chanwa. Amazing, beautiful, inspirational poem. Um, so thank you for that. And I'm sure you'll speak more on it when we get to the questions and what, what the message behind it was. Um, so in the last two um, series, I tried to kind of break down the word equity through the picture on the left. So um, I didn't want to recycle content. So I'm going to just present it in a more simplified way. So, you know, orally, you could try to consume the picture on the left, you know, the difference between equality and equity and liberation equality being treat everybody the same, but that doesn't mean they're gonna be in the best position to achieve their full potential. Equity meaning we wanna treat everybody fair based on their needs and different people are gonna have different needs. Um, and we wanna eventually break down the systemic barriers, which is why there's no fence in the liberation. So the analogy I wanna to use today is if you think about you know, students sitting in a classroom at different places, different distances away from a garbage can, and you tell everybody, take a paper, crumple it up, I want you to get it in. Does everybody have an opportunity? Yes. Um, does everybody gonna try hard? Yes. But for some people, simply due to that distance, being closer to the garbage, that task is gonna be easier. And I'm, bring, I'm using this analogy for us to reflect on the privileges we have as it intersects with race, religion, and the focus of this session, which is um, gender, right? And so um, think about it. Yes, even the person that's the furthest back is trying their hardest. And oftentimes, you know, we have this assumption that you're not trying hard enough or else you get the opportunity. But sometimes, even if you try twice as hard as the person in the front, uh, there's a systemic barrier. Um, and until we recognize that's a barrier and we talk about it and we reach that brave space of trying to challenge it, we're not going to change those conditions. And that's what the goal is. And hopefully this analogy um, makes a little bit more sense coming at it from a different angle. And if all that is abstract, I'm gonna wrap up with some numbers before we turn to our panelists, all right? And my focus is the intersection of sexism and racism. In the, in the previous sessions, we kind of talked about the, the power and privilege um, intersectionality, how you are the sum of your parts. So in a Canadian society that's known for being so multicultural, there's still barriers for people. So I'm gonna give you non-sports examples and then bring it back to sports. So, Racialized women, meaning you know people who are BIPOC or not in the dominant position in society, earn only about 81.4 cents for every dollar paid to a non-racialized Canadian. Uh, if I wanna break this down more by gender, men and women, racialized men made about 78 cents, I'm rounding it up for every dollar that a non-racialized man made. If we break it down by woman, racialized women earn 88 cents for every dollar that a non-racialized woman earned. And if we actually combine the two, so the gender factor and the race factor, which is why I call it the intersection of sexism and racism, racialized women earn only 55.6 cents for every dollar a non-racialized men earned in 2005. Yes, it's a bit of an older statistics, but we can go to the picture on the right um, to think about what this means for sports. There's a big Basketball wage gap, right? The highest earning female player in 2018, 163,000 versus a male player at the time. These are 2018, 37 million. So a big difference. Um, I mean, there is more awareness. There's more discussion happening, but progress is slow. And therefore, we kind of have to take advantage of this momentum where a lot of equity issues are gaining so much attention 
going back to the George Floyd incident, what's happening with our indigenous community that's coming to light. And so there is more consciousness and this is why we need to continue. So in conclusion, race and gender matters. And this is why it's a systemic problem, even in a lovely multicultural country like Canada. Okay, so keep that in mind as we are going to shift gears uh, to our lovely panelists. So um, Sally and Bryce are helping me out with the event. Uh, perhaps one of you can put the event bright page. Their resumes all can be 45 minutes or longer if I read them because they're so accomplished. So this is pretty much um, the nugget combo here. You're getting them in a, all in 30 seconds. All right, we have Natalie Achonwa, who is currently playing in the WNBA from Minnesota and is on the Canada Basketball Diversity Council. Uh, we have Krista Eniojukin. Congratulations. I had to update this information because as of last week, she's been uh, uh, transitioning from the UOIT head coach to the York University women's team and is a former educator with the Toronto District School Board. We have Erica Gable, who is a uh, her Olympian, uh, plays for Wheelchair Basketball Canada, has accomplished um, some great uh, medals at the Paralympics World Championships, and is also a PhD candidate at UOIT along with being many on many other committees uh, within wheelchair basketball. We have Noor Bazzi, um, who um, graduated from St. Clair's College and now is um, transitioning to OUA to play at the University of Windsor, who uh, wears the hijab playing uh, in OCAA and has been an inspiration to many other Muslim uh, basketball players and others. We have Tashana Higgins, who's worn all sorts of hats from playing division one basketball, um, coaching and playing in Iceland, Spain, out France, other countries, and now being a trainer and a basketball official with the Toronto Association of Basketball Officials. And me, I'm boring, so we'll skip me to have more time. All right, um, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, we're gonna turn it over to the panelists. And we always start off with a pretty easy question, kind of just to get the audience to get to know you better. Um, it's going to be organic, so feel free to jump in. There's no particular order. And the first question is, you know, how did you gravitate towards basketball? And what does basketball really represent and mean in your life, given your life trajectory? So anybody feel free to um, jump in. All right, I'll go first. Uh, I'm Natalie Achanwa. Um, I actually started playing basketball originally by accident. I tell the story all the time. Uh, my father's Nigerian, so naturally I had a soccer ball or a football in front of me since I could walk um, and I was playing soccer and I had a random growth spurt in the seventh grade and my soccer coach was like, you're kind of tall, you should try to play basketball. So I started playing basketball. Um, and that's kind of got here uh, where I am today. And now my perception of basketball, of course, when I was young was just, it was a sport. It was an opportunity to be active. Uh, my brother played basketball and I wanted to be like him. So I played basketball, but now um, I love what basketball can do for me um, and what I can use basketball to do. Um, everyone always thinks like, oh, she's just a basketball player, but um, the sport has opened so many avenues for me and to be able to connect with people, to be able to learn from people. Um, I've traveled all over the world. I went to um, one of the best universities in the U.S. for free um, and all because of putting a ball in a hoop. So I love that kind of unifying aspect of basketball and how it allows me to connect with so many different people of different cultures, different backgrounds. Um, and although we can get into how it's difficult to start and, and financial disparities on playing basketball, but when you're on a court, if you're outside, you're playing on the blacktop, like it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter who you are, how much money you have, like you put the ball in a hoop and it doesn't discriminate. So um, the sport itself, I think can be so great. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a little bit my background. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you for sharing. Um, who would like to go next, jump in. Okay, I'll go next. Oh, 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 sorry, beat you to it. <laughs> Uh, for me, um, I, you know, grew up in a marginalized community, low income community. So outdoors playing ball with the guys, with the rest of the kids, it's a no brainer, right? So that's how I gravitated to it. And I just fell in love with the game. You know, if any of those guys are going to watch this, I really appreciate you guys letting me play this, this young little girl and they didn't hold back because I was a female, I would get the elbows, right? I would have to take far shots because it would block my stuff when I come into the key, 
right? So that all impacted me to be where I am right now. And, you know, this, where this inner city kid had an opportunity to, you know, broaden my horizons and be able to now share it with other youth because representation is key, right? And um, moving forward now, just be able to give that little nugget to them, like, hey, you guys can do it. Don't let these walls fool you. There's a whole life out there that you can experience. So, you know, that's what it really means to me now is just paying it forward and then, you know, sharing this journey with these young youth and whoever wants to learn. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Kristani Ojukin. Um, for me, I started off in individual sports. I was really competitive in track and gymnastics. And then in grade eight in middle school, I was introduced to basketball and I was like, well, team sports are just way more fun. Like the idea of collaborating, collaborating with other people and working for a common goal. And I think ever since that time when I was a 13 year old girl, that's all I've ever wanted to do is to be a part of a team and try to achieve something together. And, you know, through that, even when I was teaching before, I was always coaching on the side. Um, using basketball is something to build relationships and community and to help people to strive to be better. And I think when you build that deeper connection with somebody, um, it can go be way beyond the court. And so whether that's academically or your careers or so forth, but you know, those special relationships can really help change a community for the greater good. Wonderful. Um, I'm Erica Gable. Um, I play wheelchair basketball, but I think in terms of, um, my basketball career and what gravitated me towards basketball can kind of broken up, be broken up into two parts. So before my wheelchair basketball career, I played um, university for the University of Saskatchewan um, for like four years before my knee injury. And what gravitated me towards basketball was um, when I was growing up, my mom had a really bad schizophrenia. And um, I would say I, came, I come from like a very uh, turbulent environment. And for me, sport was a way to, um, I guess, like get out of my house. Um, as soon as the gym teacher opened the gym at 6 a.m., I was there. If there was open gym after school, I was there. Um, my cousin and I were always playing basketball at the park just because it was, um, it was a lot better than being at home. And the reason why I decided to actually um, pursue basketball was when I was in grade nine, uh, Lisa Tomitis and uh, Sarah Cooks came to my school and did a, a basketball camp. And they said, if, uh, if any of you guys, and I'm from the North. So to meet someone who come from the university to my hometown was like a big deal. And both of them said, uh, if you practice every single day, you could play for the Huskies and maybe play for Team Canada. And Sarah told her story and she came from a small town in uh, Southern Saskatchewan. And she said, well, I didn't start playing basketball till like grade 11 or grade 12. And in my mind, I'm like in grade 9 or grade 10. I'm like, well, she did. I have two more years of practice. So <laughs> I could do it too. <laughs> so then from like the end of grade nine through grade 11, um, I practiced every day and then got a scholarship at U of S. Um, so that was amazing. Um, so like, Nora, you say you're going to Windsor. We lost like every year nationals. <laughs> so that's not good luck. Um, but then when my knee injury happened, I was, uh, I, I don't know, it was almost like everything got ripped away from me. Um, and then one of the reasons why I decided to train for real was because um, I, I don't know if people actually thought it was true, but I told Lisa that a sports scientist in Saskatchewan, uh, his name's Bruce Craven um, and Rhonda Shishkin, who's also a physio for a uh, national team now, they're like, if you listen to us, you could make the national team and go to the Paralympics in Rio. You just have to follow this training program. Um, and then I did, and then I made the team. And at that point too, I was doing very poor in school. So um, basketball has, uh, 
I really don't know where I would be without it, to be completely honest, from a professional standpoint and um, academic, like I probably, I don't know what I'd be doing. So um, yeah, I'm, I owe basketball my entire life. Yeah, super grateful. <laughs> Great, thank you for sharing. I know it's not easy. All right, Noor, how about you? Uh, my name's Noor. Um, I'm from Windsor, Ontario, born and raised. Um, I started playing basketball when I was eight years old. Um, just like you, to Shauna, you know, my, my guy cousins always playing on the street, you know, wanted to get involved. That's kind of how it started. Um, I have three older siblings and both of my sisters played basketball. So I really looked up to them and, you know, thought it was a very, very like fun sport. Um, I gravitated towards it because it was a main sport in my household. Um, I love the Raptors. Chris, Chris Bosch was by far one of my favorite players. Um, honestly, when I started playing, it was just an instant connection. I, I can't even explain it. As soon as I touched that ball, it was just, I knew I wanted to play for the rest of my life if I could. Um, it just brought me so much joy. And it was something that I can't really explain. Like, like you said, Erica, I, I owe my life to basketball. It's, it's done more than I can imagine. You know, it's brought me closer to, to friends that I will have for a lifetime. And I'm more than grateful for that. Um, I'm grateful for this experience. Basketball obviously gave me that. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Um, it's, to me, it's not just a sport. It's a part of who I am now. And I consider that to be the fact for the rest of my life, you know, I'll, I played college basketball, it was always my dream. You know, I didn't start playing um, travel ball until I was in grade 11. Um, so that was a little uh, too far uh, in terms of my basketball experience. You know, everyone always used to start like grade nine, grade eight, things like that. I never had the opportunity for that. So I was thankful to have it, you know, sooner than later. Um, so I started playing travel in grade 11 and then I was recruited to St. Clair College um, after I graduated. And since then, it's been nothing but amazing. Um, now I graduated from St. Clair, and hopefully I get an opportunity to play at the University of Windsor. But, yeah. All right, great. Thank you all for sharing. So hopefully you feel a little more comfortable because now the questions get a little bit tougher. And, you know, although basketball has put you in great positions and given you opportunities, I'm sure it hasn't always been positive. Um, so the next question is, you know, what was your first encounter or it could be an encounter that happened later on, a memorable encounter in basketball where you became critically conscious of um, gender inequities or gender injustices or being treated unfairly? Can you give some example where perhaps you felt you're being excluded or stereotyped because of your identity or gender? And how did you navigate the challenge at the time? And you know, how do you look at that situation in retrospect and how it impacted you? Oh, now nobody wants to go first. Oh, no, I can go. I'm fine. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, for me, in terms of gender inequities, um, like where I'm from, nobody really plays organized basketball. Um, like being from the north, we didn't have club basketball. Um, the high school programs weren't very strong. So I would say um, it was very much like equal. Um, per se, and I think one of the cool things about the University of Saskatchewan women, women's basketball program is that I would say in the city, it's one of like the main sports, like we don't have professional uh, teams, so people either go to the football or women's basketball. So there then overall numbers and capacity. Um, I didn't ever feel like things we're not equal, but where I do see this the most actually um, is being involved in Paralympic sports. Um, and maybe not so much like gender inequities, but like Paralympic versus Olympic. And I think that's something that, I mean, like you look at the university system in Canada and there isn't one Paralympic program yet our government pours millions and millions of dollars into Paralympic sport, right? And I mean, even in the state, there's only four universities that have um, any sort of Paralympic program. And same from like the research um, 
standpoint too, like if you type in Google Scholar Olympic versus Paralympic, there's going to be like a 20 fold difference um, between the two. So I think there's like Paralympic and Olympic inequities, but then when you like even go down to the lower level, gender inequities among Paralympic sports and even gender, but then there's also like sport inequities just based on certain disabilities will look more athletic than other disabilities, yet certain sports will actually bring Canada the, the most medals and probably from like the funding standpoint. So um, it's very layered. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great example, Nathan. Thank you for bringing that because I think enough. A lot of times the conversations don't intersect with um, ability and disability, and I think that's a great perspective you add to the to the conversation. Uh, others? Yeah, I was just gonna add. Um, I mean, there's a lot of little small instances that I can think of, but one that kind of sticks out to me is that I didn't learn about the WNBA until I was in college like I play in the professional women's league and I didn't even know it existed in Canada until I was in college mind you I know I had a little bit of a different kind of path to get to basketball where I wasn't like from a young age super invested but I remember going to the Raptors jerseys I remember having Carter jerseys in my house like us being at Raptors games and that being watching the NBA in my household but never a conversation about the WNBA never seeing a game on TV never knowing about women playing basketball until I was kind of integrated in this uh, national team program and in Canada basketball and then seeing like, wow, these, there's so many amazing women that play this sport, but I never really clicked to my head that like men are the standard for what reason, um, but that's just what it is. Uh, and men, NBA was on TV and um, I never really had this, this ability to aspire to play in the WNBA or see these women um, firsthand on something that I could be when I grow up. Um, and I, if I wasn't a part of the Canada basketball program, like going through the NIDAs and the junior national team and being able to watch our senior national team, I wouldn't really have had that in my forefront. Um, and so that, and that's not an opportunity that's available to everyone. Um, well, clearly. <laughs> um, and so how do you have someone, I think brought it up already about representation. How do you, aspire to be something you can't see or you don't even know exists. Um, and I think that, especially from a gender standpoint, is something that um, we need to continue to push forward. Now we have games on TV. Now we're playing events in Toronto and the Pan Am games. And now we have this partnership with Edmonton where people and young girls always come and they're like, I want to be like you. And I'm like, that feels so good <laughs> like to be able to have people look up to us. And I'm just missing that gap when I was younger. Um, I, uh, it continues to need work, but it's definitely better than it was when I was a kid, at least. All right, thank you for sharing. I, I agree, just to kind of piggyback on what Natalie was talking about. That was me growing up too, you know. I can't remember exactly the age, but I just remember saying, yeah, I'm gonna go to the NBA, I'm gonna go to, and telling these guys, you know, I'm saying out loud in my house, and my sister's like, you goof, you, you, you can't go, you're a female you know, you got to go to the WNBA. And I'm like, WNBA? And so she kind of educated me and showed me the way. And, and then she had a poster of Cheryl Swoops. I still have it to this day, right? And I'm like, what? And I saw Cheryl Swoops play, and I'm like, yo, she's like, MJ! I was going crazy, right? But um, going back to what Natalie was saying, but we don't have that opportunity to say, to get even close to, to you know, WNBA players or people who played at that high level for these for these youth to say, you know what, I want to, I want to be like them. You know, we don't have that. We didn't have that opportunity. So it's like in your, in the back of your mind. I was more so when people would ask me, Hey, do you want to go to WNBA? I'm like, uh, I would be like, yeah, I'm going to go overseas. That's where I'm going to make my bread. That's where I'm going to make my money. You know, going overseas, it wasn't like WNBA, but it, it's like she said, you know, it's, there are improvements. It's, you know, it steps forward, but we definitely need to, to make, to take leaps. Like we need a, a big jump and it's about time because the talent is there. The talent is there. So we just need, you know, that extra push to kind of, you know, like be that, uh, that 
that view, that real view for these these young women, like, hey, I could do it and I could even live off of being a WNBA player. I don't have to go look for no next job. You don't have to do, I don't have to worry about going overseas. Like I can fend for myself after, the, after a, a WNBA contract. So yeah, lots of work to be done, but you know, still moving forward. I definitely want to add something, something to that. I went to my first WNBA game a couple of years ago, um, Chicago Sky versus um, New York Liberty. So I watched Kia Nurse for the first time in person. I was like, I didn't even know what to say. I was sitting courtside with my best friend and it was just amazing. Like everyone always says, you know, NBA games are so hyped. They're the best. No, WNBA is the place to be like, I, I like when I found out about WNBA, the first thing that I wanted to do was research who the highest paying player is compared to the NBA. And when I did that, I started, you know, investing myself in, in doing that kind of research and just seeing how absurd it is. And for example, Sabrina Ayunescu, I don't know how to say it, I'm sorry. Um, crazy player, I'm sure you all know about her, crazy player, $69,000 is her salary. And I am just mind blown because I don't know how that is even possible for someone to be so amazing at the level that she plays at, at the things that she has accomplished, only to be paid what a teacher in Windsor or Ontario is paid a year. Or, you know what I mean? It's just something that's so eye opening and something that is can be changed, something that can be adjusted, you know, you just give them what they deserve. It's, it's, it's that simple. And I understand people say the NBA revenue, you know, it's higher. It's true. Numbers don't lie, but that doesn't mean you just forget that what women can do. You don't just give them less because they are women. You know what I mean? And that's, that's something that needs to be changed very, very soon. And again, like you said, they, there are being like, there are being changes, you know, they're getting better. It's getting better slowly, but it needs to continue getting better. It can't just get better for a couple of years, then stop. It needs to be continuous, consistent, and it just needs to go up from here for women in any type of sport. Um, just changing perspective and looking at it from the top through administration down to coaches. And, you know, I myself never had a female coach ever, any sport I played. Um, and whether that was school, club, rep, nothing, right? And so um, I actually like don't even know why I really thought I could do it when I never saw anybody that looked like me. But I do know that um, the opportunities that were given um, to me to be a provincial team coach really built up my confidence to be able to want to do this as a full-time coach. And um, I think it's very important that women surround themselves with people um, that are gonna help embrace that because I did face challenges within the club system um, with men not really being comfortable with um, me being a female coach and wanting to be the head coach and wanting um, to do certain things. And I think that if we're really going to make a significant change, we have to be able to give a lot of women um, roles. And I don't just mean within university because I think that some of the top um, organizations, the PSOs, the national programs, the youth sports, the, I think they're doing a lot better job. And that's where a lot of the change is happening, right? But I mean, at the grassroots level, like if I go to recruit and I'm looking at the rep programs, 90% are coached by men. And the females, and often like, you know, some high level females that have um, playing experience or so forth, are you know, doing great things in their community. And they're like managers on the, like, they don't do any significant um, role. And so having those serious conversations with the people that run clubs so that more women can shine and grow and make bigger impacts um, and are put in administrative roles as well. Great, thank you all for sharing. And I think that's a good segue to the next question because when I think about it, I mean, a lot of you kind of focused on the WNBA and I think about, well, how many people not seeing the role model, not seeing the representation end up leaving sports, right? I mean, 
most people don't even make it to that level. So, you know, you have, all of you have overcome such barriers to make it in the positions you are at. Most people leave sports because it's not fun, whether that intersects with different aspects of their identity. So the next question is really trying to shift the conversations to hear your perspective on, well, yeah, we're doing better, but what are the action oriented things we really need to do? And so the question is, what can organizations, whether it's basketball or you could think on a larger scale, do to mitigate uh, the sexism Im embedded in institutional policies and practices to try to create and ensure equitable access to opportunities? Because as we said, some people try really, really hard, whether it's a money issue, whether it's, you know, bullying, whether it's not seeing a representation, they leave sports. So in your opinion and your experiences, what has worked and what is not working? And therefore, what did, how do we need to change gears to walk that um, line of continuing to address and mitigate the systemic issues? I'm gonna, gonna give a short, quick, short and sweet one here. And then Erica, you can jump in, but um, it's along the lines of what Krista was just talking about. Um, often people hire people that look like them or people in their circles. Um, good old boys club is what it's always been and people hire their friends and that's how the circle and the web goes. So it's being able to put people in roles of position like Krista was just saying, head coaching roles. So now she can hire more women, hire more black women. Um, and so you can have that representation and streamline down what we were talking about. Um, challenging your partners, whether that's like business partners, um, for me, like sponsorship partners, any companies that you um, use or that you have friends in, um, it's always challenging them to do more and not surface, put a black square on Instagram or to um, highlight a female of the month. It's to put women in positions um, that, that make decisions. And um, so then we can start hiring people that look like us and then maybe we'll balance the skills. Yeah, I think um, just to kind of piggyback off what uh, Nat and Krista were saying, I think another important piece too is um, is to like, you need to develop women when they're younger so that when it comes to hiring um, people for those roles, they need to actually be qualified and able to do a good job. Otherwise, if you put them in the positions where they're not necessarily 100% qualified for you're almost like um uh whatchamacallit acknowledging or proving like some people's points of like oh we told you so that they wouldn't do a good job and I think like more mentorship um like like almost like identify people who you see might have potential and then really invest in them and mentor them throughout their uh career so that when it comes time, when they apply, they're qualified. I want to, sorry, I got to jump back in, Erica. I loved your point about mentorship, but I want to challenge your thinking about the qualification part, because as women, we're always taught that we need to be like overqualified for these roles, but men all of a sudden get these egos and they've played basketball in the third grade and all of a sudden they're qualified to be a GM, but I got to play professional sports for 10 years. I have to coach for eight years and then I have, but you don't have no head coaching experience. This is why I'm applying for the job to get head coaching experience. The same way I tried to get a credit card and they're like, you have no credit. Hence why I'm here. But like a reminder to women, like yes, mentorship and that growth from a young standpoint is so important, but also like, giving women avenues to get to this position, to learn, to get that experience and, and not always so focused on this perception that society tries to put on us that we need to be super qualified for a role. No, we need a chance to be able to have that education and that mentorship you talked about. We need those things because men will, are quick to apply for a job that they're not qualified for, but I got to be twice as qualified to get it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, by, um, by qualified, I mean like just having like the competent skills that when you get into the position, you're able to um, like succeed. Cause I know like going off of my own experience, I've had leaders who get put in a position that they're not qualified, like qualified as in maybe they don't have the life experience or uh, even like the background, like what I'm starting to learn, like getting more involved with um, committees and being like a representative is that as athletes, 
like the environment that we're in from like in high performance sport it's you, nobody can like you can't replicate that type of team um expectations like even with school and some of the jobs i've had it's like all right so i come here when i'm tired and all i have to do is like sit down and think right but when you're like in a training camp like when you're or at a big tournament you're super tired you're super irritable and it's like one of my friends says like halt like hungry angry lonely and tired and you have to perform physically so i think like as athletes um you just develop so many skills as women that you're gonna be qualified even just based on being in like that savage of environment for so many years <laughs> wonderful i think uh you know great points raised and the whole idea of the dialogue is to look at it and tackle it from the different angles and um you all carry weight with your points the whole i think the goal is to kind of take down this systemic barrier and create that pathway and access to opportunity which um uh, we're trying to continue to get um others krista tashana noor do you want to jump on that question yeah I was just going to give an example because you're completely right, Nat. Um, both the job, my last two jobs, I was sought out for. And I am qualified. And I could get those jobs without being asked to, to apply. But my personal confidence and what, you know, I hear and listen to stopped me. And when, I, when I've been on other groups and committees so forth and other women and um i'll give a shout out to coach liana jose who started the black female mentorship program um i was a part of the pilot one from last year and although we were mentoring others um us mentors got so much out of it because it was the first time that i was in a room with 20 other black women who were high level coaches and had the same experience as I did. And we all had different stories of like that. And, you know, it was certain other people that championed us, that pushed us forward. So having allies and other people to be like, yes, because you're absolutely right. The number of people that I've heard that would be like, yeah, I, I don't know, I coach elementary school and have no other coaching experience, but of course I can be a university coach. And it's like, but I've done like every single thing you can think of and I'm still questioning if I can do that job. Like that just doesn't make sense, right? So really making sure that the next young women coming up are coming and thriving and getting the support like Eric is saying to thrive and succeed and aren't intimidated for ask for what they want and aren't like I have to check every box. Thank you. And I would even add, like, it's not just necessarily the competency, sometimes the, the process of applying, right? Who can put together, uh, you know, a 20 page package um, and all that. So the process itself is sometimes rigged and kind of stacks the odds against you, irrelevant of your competency, even if you're underqualified or overqualified, but who has, who has gained those skills from a young age, going through what education system and having access to what networks and what mentorship. Um, no and Tashana, you no pressure. You don't have to hop on this question. The next question is also very similar. So if you have anything to add, now is the time. If not, uh, I'll pose the next question. I just wish I had more female coaches. I've had one female coach and it was amazing. Um, my college experience, male coach. Um, but I, I really, really look up to Chantal Valet, the University of Windsor coach. Um, she's amazing, five championships. Um, hopefully I get to learn a lot from her, whether it's on the bench, in the coaching staff, whatever opportunity I get. Um, I definitely want to be the, the person who is built up and mentored to be a coach someday. You know what I mean? I, I would love to coach little people up to as old as I can, you know, and it's something I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to stay involved in basketball, whether I'm on the court or I'm on the sidelines. Um, but yeah learning from all of you it's i love it so thank you <laughs> Beautiful. all right tashana are you yeah. well when i thought about this question i was just thinking about um the events that happen like uh especially the, the basketball events that happen within our community and how 
um, how when it's the men's side, it's promoted heavily and they have all these team, all these male teams and stuff like that. But when it comes to the women's side, you know, they're, you know, they're struggling. They're, they're, and not only that, their organization skills to getting other women's teams involved, it's like really last minute. And, you know, they, we, we enjoy being mentors to the younger generation, but, you know, as older female players, we want to play against older female players. So I feel like they don't put in the much effort with promoting, you know, the other side for the female side. Um, for instance, say, like the Crown League, a great league, a great league, but they had no women's side to it. And then they did for one year, they, I guess they tried it. I don't know what they did, they scrapped it. One, one, right? So I'm just like, but I never heard, I never really knew about it. I don't think they had it open to a lot of players. You know, I think it would have been a great opportunity for these young girls to come to that event and see high level basketball players who knows maybe if Natalie wasn't busy, busy, she'd be there playing, right? And we get to say, like, oh, you know, WBA player, overseas player, like it would have been a great opportunity going back onto representation. So stuff like that kind of, you know, it bothers me. You know, I don't think that there's not much effort being put onto the women's side when you're having these events. So that could be a great way to kind of, you know, promote women promote women basketball and give more representation to these young girls who are like, you know, oh, I want to play sports. And, and also, as Arvind was saying, help them stay into the sport because the more that they see, the more that they will believe that, hey, you know what, I am capable. And I did go to this event. Look at Nora. She's like, yeah, I went to WNBA games, so I'm here nurse. And like when she said it, she just smiled as if she was there yesterday, right? So that's so important. And, you know, just moving forward that, it just needs to be more on the forefront. So if any of those people are, are watching and you know, you're hosting events, just you know, put more effort into the woman's side. Like don't last minute it, don't say, okay, okay, you know, you know, and then put like one group, put like 14 year olds with 30 year old women. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I said, we enjoy, you know, being mentors to these young girls, but we also want to play, we're competitors too. You know, we also want to play against our age and you can't tell me that there's not enough women. You just can't tell me that. There's a lot of women who are playing basketball still in their older age. So you just got to reach out to them and make more of an effort because you see these, you know, these men still playing, you know, they have five, six kids and they're still playing. So just putting more effort. That's all I have to say. Great. Thank you. I mean, I remember always uh, going to ref the Jaden Finch tournament and Tashana will pull up with the whole team and she'll bring the whole community out. So it's always a good vibes. And it's all about relationship building. So I think the next question is really just continue to dissect this. And um, we've talked about representation. And I think we're at a stage in 2021 where organizations need to go simply from being welcoming and seeking representation because a lot of times that's done in a very superficial checklist approach. Like, oh, here is the black person we hired, the Muslim person, the female, we're done. Right. We hire, we increased our representation by 5%. So we're doing a great job. I think organizations need to be actually anti-oppressive, which is not only get them there. And I think this is a theme we started, but be inclusive, you know, value them for what they bring, whether that's a skill set, whether that's a lived experience um, um, and their competencies. So they stay there. And I'll give you an example is uh, from an officiating lens. Um, if you look at every officiating organizations across Canada and probably I could say across the world, the makeup of women officials compared to men's is drastically much less. And many of them leave the sport after a few years. And many of them have shared with me that they had you know, very negative sexual comments made towards them when they're officiating on the court, off the court, you know, advances made towards them at, at camps and so forth. And I think that speaks to something that's not spoken about or people are afraid to talk about uh, because of who is in a position of power and they want to advance their career. So it's almost like people have to sacrifice who they are versus where they want to get to. And I think that's important. This is why we're saying we have to have these brave conversations. And unless we start calling it out, we can't really change it because some people think it doesn't exist. When you bring it up, um, uh, people dismiss it as, oh, that's a one-time thing. So the next question is, you know, how important are uh, perhaps the role of allies and solidarity in doing this work, trying to kind of have that turnover effect? Of course, females are going to lead. But I think uh, 
when we talk about systemic change, it has to be all hands on deck. And there are many people who are willing to unlearn who, uh, you know, when they, when they hear these issues, they want to help, uh, but don't know how to do it. So I think, you know, uh, think about people from different trajectories, male, female, other genders, uh, what they self-identify as, how can they get involved? And I think, you know, now we're going beyond your experience, you know, what would you say simply are action oriented ways, not just theoretical uh, one or two nuggets that, you know, here's something you can do tomorrow. Here's something you can do tonight. Here's something you can do every day or next month. So uh, let's hear some of your suggestions on how to try to create that turnover systemic change effect. Take a moment to digest it. I mean, I, while, people are, while people are thinking I can give like a super basic one, I also uh, sit on the executive committee of the WMBPA, so our Players Association, our Players Union for the WNBA. And we make a lot of demands. Uh, we want to be on more TV. We want uh, more money. We want more all of these things, better uh, resources, access to things. And the way that um, the way that any person can help, it doesn't matter if you're an ally or if you are a woman and stuff like that, is like when we're asking to be on TV, turn the TV on. Like when the game is on TV, whether you're watching or not, turn it on your TV. You see a post, it's like resharing that post. If they, you have the means or the funds, come to a game um, or buy a jersey, like little things like that. Anything we're asking for more, it always has to be backed up by numbers. We always have to, as women, especially, um, we always have to prove ourselves before we get it. So it's like, oh, you want to be on TV? Okay, well, why? No one's going to watch it. And then guess what happened last year after the bubble? He put us on ABC one game and ESPN one game. And what are we, 120 whatever percent increase in, in viewership? So we need the actionable items for when we're making these demands. Um, I understand the business aspect that I'm not like just like pay me more money. Like I understand they are businesses. The gap comes from when the NBA takes a loss, you don't, every team in the NBA is not profitable. I don't care what they say, like if you really open the books, so don't believe all the hype. But as a whole, um, when you see people giving money to teams or earlier in the NBA season, like mind you, our league is only 25 years young. <laughs> like <laughs> scroll back to when the NBA was where we're at and the numbers, our numbers will exceed them. So um, it's always looked at as a loss when it comes to the WNBA or, or women instead of an investment. And so it, once again, if we're asking corporations to invest in us, we need um, our friends, our allies, our people to back us up with the numbers. Great, others? And just to kind of reiterate what I was saying, like hosting events, like those are our allies too. So again, representation, I'm gonna say it all night. So it's gonna ring in ears like, Representation, yes, representation, like having these events that really, really um, highlight women athletes and not, you know, can I say half ass? Can I say that? So yeah, just like not half ass in it, like really, like really put in effort, like really put in effort and, and, and um, that's a great way of being an ally and promoting. There are some events out there that um, are out there that highlight women's sports and basketball and stuff like that but um on a whole like as Nali was saying share it you know this share it like it that that does numbers for us right so yeah just to kind of just piggyback on that that aspect just share it liking it's it's something so simple but so necessary when you're trying to get okay numbers and you know trying to show these people like hey people do care people do watch people are interested and so forth so yeah, that's my, that's my Great. I will, uh, I'll piggyback on both of them. Um, and I love, you know, Nally's message from the video to what she's just saying of investing in women. Um, um, but like, not just at the pro level, like it's super important. Like I grew up in Guelph and I lived at U of G and if it wasn't for watching those women, who else would I have looked up to, to be able to play sport at the university level, right? And it was great quality basketball. And I think we often forget that as a community, um, just like looking inside around, whether that is a prep team that's local or a high school team or a college team or a university team, like there's a lot of great things happening within the community and supporting those. And not just, I think as Tashana is saying, not just lip service. If you wanna actually support, come out, um, and support. And I would say for me, 
um, a lot of my like most important people, mentors and so forth have been my allies and champions and they've been there since day one. And they've supported me through whatever I'm doing at any level, fundraiser, golf, that like it doesn't matter. And they're showing up for me um, in any capacity that they can. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Erica, I know you wanna jump on this question. Um, I completely agree. Oh, Erica. No, you can go, go ahead. Um, I, completely, I come from a, a small city in, in, in Ontario um, and I can't really tell you how many events that we've had for women in sports. Um, like Krista said, like there isn't really anyone for me to look up to in Windsor or close by or anything like that because it's so limited. It's it's like you you don't really hear about the WNBA here. No one talks about it. No one goes. To, I don't I don't know anyone who who's been to an NBA game that I know or WNBA game that I know. Sorry, and it's just very unfortunate because it's something like Tashana said. It's so simple. You just share a post. You know post something yourself it's watch a game just put it on in the background like just do something you know it's or like myself as I get older I want to hold as many events as I can for for all women all girls um it's it's something that I that excites me I love doing it it's you know when I can you know rent a gym just have the gym full of girls who can just do whatever they want it doesn't even have to be you know I tell you what to do no get up some shots cross up your friends, do whatever you want. As long as you're in the gym, as long as you just you get, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It gets me very angry because it's just something so simple and women need to be prioritized. Women need to be put on a, on a pedestal because we're awesome. You know, we can do so much, but we're never given the chance. So. Yeah. I think um, going back to like the ally, um, comment like when I think of um having like strong allies I think of one of my basketball coaches his name's Mike Frogley and he started like he started the women's program in Illinois and it was the first uh university uh wheelchair basketball program in the entire world and then from there he helped like mentor um her name's Steph Wheeler but who then went on to coach the, the women's national team for USA and who is now the head coach um, at Illinois. And then when he came up to Canada here, he really took like our women's program to the next level from a high performance standpoint and like um, just like improving the quality of uh, women athletes with a disability. And he always talks about like, um, just like the importance of us being strong role models in the community. And so I think like when you meet those people who really advocate, like do everything you can to support them so that they keep wanting to advocate and uh, put people's names forward. Wonderful. Thank you all for sharing. I mean, I, I, I teach a lot about allyship, but I think the point, the thing I want to point out is the community decides if you're an ally. A lot of people like to like post stuff that they're ally and this and that, but really it's the community that decides if you're an ally and the actions speak for themselves. Because sometimes I feel like it's a trend that people uh, want to say they're an ally, especially when things go down. It's very performative. Um, and the actions kind of speak louder than words. Um, so I think we'll, we'll bring it to the last question because we do want to have some Q&A um, um, questions. So uh, the last question, I'm going to ask, uh, keep it to one minute and uh, you can take on any of these two questions. Either um, if you can give advice to your old self as you were growing up and kind of navigating some of these systemic challenges, what would you say? Or what would you say to someone who is younger, who is trying, who is dealing with some of these similar issues, who is on this call or is going to watch the recording? What would you say? And you only get about one minute. So we need some punchlines. All right. So um, anybody can go when they're ready. And then we'll turn it over to Q&A and I'll share some resources to wrap it up. I'll go first. Go okay. I didn't interrupt anyone. Um, personally, the experiences that I've had, um, I've been to a local high school where I've spoken to um, Muslim young females. 
And from my experience, you know, being up there um, with my St. Clair jersey on with a basketball in my hand, a girl came up to me and asked me, would I even play? Would I even, would I even be considered because of what I'm wearing? And honestly, that really like touched my heart, <laughs> kind of made me emotional. Um, Cause she basically said, I want to be you. So. <laughs> Ah, uh, sorry. <laughs> Next person. That's all right. We'll come back to you when you're ready. This is exactly what it's all about, man. It's more than a game. And you can't tell me that we don't deserve the respect and, uh, and, and level that these men are getting because it's, it's life changing for us. You know, it's, it's not just like now you were saying this pick up a ball and dribble, it's way more. This is deep. This is deep. So thank you, Nora. Oh my gosh, you're going to be so amazing. I'm super, super excited for what's to come from you and the women you're going to empower. Um, for myself, what I would tell myself is just keep going. Um, you know, regardless if you made this team or you made that team, you know, it doesn't define you, right? The circumstances you're faced at the moment, it does not define you. Continue to grow, continue to learn, continue to, you know, trust people. You know, coming from where I am, I don't really trust too many people, you know, their intentions, you know, um, but just be a little bit more trusting and open to, you know, different experiences at a younger age. That kind of happened more as I grew older um, by no choice. But, um, but yeah, just, and, and as for young girls, you know, you may not be in a situation where you have a lot of representation of women in sports or, you know, as a, as a basketball player or as a coach, but you can be that representation. You be that, you be that person that you wish that you saw or you, you want beside you to kind of help you. Or, and if not seek out, you know, um, we're, we're, we're not monsters. You know, we, we, we definitely are not monsters and always willing to help. We may be busy and whatnot, but definitely uh, reach out to somebody you, you know, you see or you, you would love to be or love to talk to. Um, don't be afraid and you never know just connect and talk with other people get in the right you know position with the right person mentor you through your process so don't give up stay focused don't quit and right? i would jump on that that if you do want to bring them in as speakers value their time right like yes. you invite people and say can you volunteer mm -hmm. it is disrespect if you're going to invite a male and pay them so also think about yes. how you approach people to become yes. part of the community and share their yes. wealth and experiences if you're in a position, you know, to be paying them because that's important as well. Good point. Good point, Artavan. Others? Um, I think like, I think the really scary thing about sport is that um, there's no guarantees in anything that you do and you're kind of like I'm just going from an athlete perspective like you have to a hundred percent completely invest in something to get to this point where at the end of the day someone could just decide whether or not they want you or um whether it's uh I study exercise physiology and it's the same thing like gender equities. I think my supervisor and I are usually the only two females um, in every meeting. And I think like looking back at myself, it's, and I even tell myself this sometimes is like, be brave. Like you're going to be in a position where uh, to speak up based on your gender or even your age or anything, but like, just be brave and do it go 100% in like everything that you do and it will always work out. Great. All right, so my key message and um, it started from when I was an educator um, in inner city Toronto and noticing that women um, or the girls in my class and started from a young age, grade six, seven, eight, would know all the answers but not say anything and it used to drive me insane um so my message to young women i'm constantly trying to push to be the best self is use your voice 
and ask for what you deserve and value yourself. So um, just constantly, and that's every single age from a four-year-old to 40-year-old to 50, like everybody, right? And, you know, I was just thinking about what you said to Shauna um, in trusting yourself and being open to allow others in. And one of the messages that I've been saying to myself, like one of my ash affirmations is um, be open to all opportunities and possibilities. And it doesn't mean I have to take them all, but be open. And that's just like, for us, that's really important, right? To just be able to seek that. Great. Is that everybody that went? Uh, I mean, Kristen took exactly what I was going to say. I feel like we're, we're always a little bit of being Canadian too, because I don't find that as much here in the US, but uh, like of this like pigeonholed of like be thankful and grateful that like what you have, like the fact that we have a national team, like the fact that we have this opportunity, like be thankful and grateful for it. If I could tell myself something when I was a little bit younger, because I'm a lot more outspoken now though, <laughs> is challenge the status quo, just because it's been done this way for years or whatever, doesn't mean that it's right. Um, be brave, be bold um, and speak up on things because if you're going to wait for other people to do it, you're going to be waiting a long time. So if it's in your, your wheelhouse, if it's in your, your capability, um, take the opportunity, own it, um, and be your own change. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, such powerful messages and thank you for willing to share all your lived and professional experiences and being a leader and a voice of change to continue to tackle some of these issues. Uh, I'm going to share a couple of resources. If you have a question, I think now is a good time to type it or in a minute or two, you can unmute yourself and ask. Um, I'm going to also share these resources that I'm going to share visually uh, with the recording in the next couple of days. Um, and, you know, just to, I mean, my concluding thought is just that, you know, um, we have to kind of question what is normal until we question that uh, and make it abnormal. We can't change it. So remember, you know, the female, the male experience, the Muslim experience, the black experience, we all gonna have, we're gonna, we all experience basketball differently. And sometimes we think everybody's experience is like that when it's not. So we have to take time to listen without interrupting, without dismissing those experiences. And then we might say, hey, you know what? Maybe I had a really positive experience, but most people don't. And why is that? What is that rooted in? And so until we question the norm, you know, I always say there's no such thing as common sense because it's socially constructed. And it goes back to kind of our binary thinking, woman, men, how should they behave? What characteristics they should have? So this is the uphill battle of uh, systemically trying to have a turnover effect and changing uh, things that are embedded in institutions as barriers. So I'll share my screen just to give you these resources. And I'm gonna rush through them just because I, I wanna hear the Q and A. So these are some great um, resources to check out. You don't need to take notes. I will send these out if you pre-registered. So Canadian Woman in Sport is a great website. Um, um, they talk about gender equity and they give you lots of uh, action oriented things to work with. Um, this is a recent report that came out last year. She belongs building social connection for lasting participation in sport, starting from a grassroots level. It's only 26 pages and it's a really, really great read. So highly recommended by Canadian Women in Sport. Uh, Female Coaching Network. Um, this is... Uh, uh, quite a great network to check out where they amplify uh, female voices and experiences. So this is also a great resource to check out. Uh, and two other organizations is Fast and Female and She's for Sports. Um, here are some stats to kind of put things into this perspective, um, thinking about why people leave sports. Uh, and they also have a great section on a Canadian, focusing on a Canadian context, on Canadian role models. Uh, and, they, and She's for Sport hosted a really great panel last year as well. Um, so I highly recommend to check that out. The YouTube link is there as well. All right. Um, so we'll go to Q&A, uh, but uh, I'll just share. Uh, we're going to put a Google survey. Sally, who's helping us, uh, please, uh, if you had a chance to stay till the end, we want feedback to continue to have these conversations. The recording will be shared. Um, you could check out our resor uh, resources on the consulting website. And next month, we're doing uh, our last two events. Next month, decentering whiteness and amplifying kind of minoritized BIPOC voices. And then the last, in August will be the last series in the event, kind of decolonizing basketball, challenges, struggles, and strategies. And all this is actually legwork to kind of 
convene a table and host a symposium in 2022 about equity, diversity, and inclusion in basketball with different organizations from national to provincial to grassroots. So this is just a start. All right. Um, I see some people are also suggesting some things in the chat. So great. All right. I'm going to try to scroll up. I see some hands up. So um, now maybe we'll start with you while I catch up on the chat. Um, see your hand is up and then we'll go to others. Um, hello. Good night. Uh, can anyone, can I, uh, you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks. I just want to say, first of all, thank you, ladies, for this. Um, I'm going to be very brief and personal right now. I'm a very shy person, but I'm going to step out my shell. Um, I was going to quit training today. I'm going to be real, real honest with you guys, and I don't want to cry. I was going to quit today because I was mentally battling with what, I, what every single thing every one of you hit today with the male dominance, the... Um, the old boys club, the no support, and what does that support look like? You know, um, being afraid to, to reach out because you're an older person and you don't want to seem weak. It, I was done. I was done because like, even with social media, I literally took everything off. And it was because of that pressure, you know, and what does, what does stepping out look like, you know, um, when this is happening to you, you know what I mean? Um, it's it's very hard. And like um, Tasha said, sorry, um, even those likes, those encouraging posts, that's important. It goes a long way, you know? And um, I think when we say, what does, what does uh, stepping out look like? It's not always pretty, you know? And can we handle these, this, these situations when we do step out? Because it, it's not always gonna be pretty when we step out and ask for help and is it going to be like oh my goodness pat on your back you know just work through it go on or is it going to be like you know what sis i got your hand in this fight because it's really not right i got your hand in this fight you know what i mean and it's like what nora said is like what all you guys said who's gonna hold your hand to walk up to that place and be like you know what this is not okay and we need to deal with this and sometimes that's what that what some of us crave and need and it's not there you know but today like you guys legit do not know i stumbled on this on instagram this morning and i and i was late coming to this but man you guys hit everything on the nail and i thank you all like i'm i'm sorry but this was thank you have a good evening guys Great. And thank you now for uh, sharing and being vulnerable and uh, sharing how you felt and how hopefully this impacted you. And um, feel free to connect uh, with any other speakers. Uh, you can send an email and uh, if that mentorship opportunity can be created. That's always good, too, but it's always good to hear. Um, great. Um, we'll go to Idris and then there's a question in the chat I'll read out. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, wow. What an experience. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I, I put a message out there that as a, as a man, like I feel so privileged to be, to be here. And I came across this by, by accident. Like I didn't mean to, it was like last night. And, um, and, and what I just heard from the, uh, uh, uh the, the, the friend who just spoke, that was really powerful. And it's also in line with what I wanted to talk to you about, which is, uh, I heard a lot about mentoring. But something really powerful that can be utilized is the idea of coaching, not coaching in the sport as we know it, but you ladies like opening your mind to let, you know, young men and women understand the mindset that you were in when you came around across those struggles. What made you still pull through? Like really open your mind and show your vulnerability at that moment and show them what you actually had to do to still make it through. Because all we see is amazing, you know, people who play well. We know that you had a lot of struggle, but we don't see the other side that actually gave you that extra boost. And that's what, you know, the young men and women today need to see because, you know, that's, that's, that's what that vulnerability is, where we feel like, okay, they're by themselves. And they want you to hold their hands. But holding their hands, not necessarily physically, right? Because you're not there. But by opening your mind to them and showing them what you did. I'm so, I'm so privileged to be here. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to meet you all. And I hope 
to connect with you again in some other way. Yeah, just to touch on that a little bit, like, and what Nell said before, like, the power of storytelling, too. It's not just put us on TV to watch us play basketball. It's like, put our stories. Why do I know LeBron, Steve Nash, and all their kids' names, but you couldn't tell me anything about the best women's basketball players in the world or telling the stories of these collegiate athletes. Um, I talk about a lot of this because mental health is something that I'm really passionate about as well. And the fact that we always put stars in this perfect realm and that they're powerful and that there are these strong people, but we don't talk about what it takes to be there and the sacrifice and the mental aspect, emotional aspect um, that it takes. So thank you for sharing that as well. And that is there. We need people to tell those stories, to show that vulnerability so that people can learn from them, that can have that connection without even needing to be a direct mentor, like being able to have these stories to be able to motivate them and inspire them. So put us on damn TV, all of our stories, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the buckets. Great, can others. I, yeah, jump in, Sean. Can I just add to what Nell was saying? And um, I, I feel like what you're feeling right now, Nell, is, is so necessary because you're passionate right? You're a passionate, you're driven to what you're doing. And, and this is, is very normal. It's, it's, it's going to be a roller coaster. It's so necessary. And like, as Ardervan said, you know, feel free to, you know, I'm saying for myself, you can reach out to me and, and talk to me. I don't know how I can help, but we're going to figure it out. But, um, but it's, it's what you're feeling is necessary. It's like, for me, I put this on my social media, whatnot, you know, I could tell that some of the people are not all here. Some people are here, some people are not. But remember, this is, you know, social media have thousands or whatever, almost a thousand. And, but it's like, um, play on to that point. It's like, you know, I did it anyways. I said, I don't care. I'm not worried about, okay, this person, that person, look, I, um, I just said he came and he stumbled upon it. You know, so somewhere somebody posted it or reposted it or something. And he found it. So it's like just doing it anyways and allowing your passion to drive you. So it's like for me going through what I'm going through, you know, I said, I'm not going to get the support from everybody, but whatever, I'm going to do it anyways, because I'm passionate about it. Right. Natalie, you want to talk about mental health. You're going to do what you got to do because you're passionate about it. Right. Krista, you're going to empower, you know, other young coaches. Look, at you, you're passionate about it. Look where you are. If you were not passionate, you would not be in this position where you are right now. Right. So it's just you are passionate now. So just keep going. You're going to have your tough days. Take them on. Definitely take them on and have your me time. Right. Take your me time and then let that passion drive you and push you to, to, to your greatness and continue to empower. Because that was beautiful. I felt I felt everything that you said. You know, and we're gonna we all go through these moments because we're passionate, right? So just keep keep doing you, girl, and anybody out there. All right. Um, okay, we have. Uh, I'm gonna read a question, and we'll take. I see a manuel's hand is up, so we'll take both questions. Just being mindful, we have about five minutes left, and I want to respect your time. So. Um, the question in the chat was, um, how do we as female sport leaders increase the demand for female sports in order to increase the numbers and quotations for female sport to actually see a difference in the pay gap? Um, that was by Christiane. And maybe we'll also take up Emmanuel's and then your panelists, uh, feel free to take on whichever question you want with any concluding remarks. And uh, we'll go from there to wrap up. Emmanuel, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes. Hey guys. Uh, I just want to, first of all, thank you guys for your time because everyone's time is respected. Um, and on top of that, I actually have more of a comment. Um, I'm a person that's always, I've always enjoyed equality in terms of women's basketball or sports in general. And I just want to go back to like the eighth grade. Um, I was playing OBA and my coach actually took us to a women's basketball game. And we went to an OUA game out in Hamilton. And the level of physicality basketball that they were playing was top notch. And I couldn't believe it at that time, right? So I'm in the eighth grade and I'm about 13 years old. And I didn't really know about that until I got to the game that very night. And after I left, I was just in awe because the 
level was just unmatched. And I said, you know what, why not? Um, and fast forwarding to me, you know, just always watching basketball, Don Staley. She's a person I looked up to when I was growing up as well, right? So she played for Charlotte. I watched Charlotte as well. Um, but really and truly, I just want to commend all you guys. Um, I've always had respect for women's sports, period. And it's more so a comment as opposed to a question I have because I just feel like you guys are underappreciated. And I think it's just time. It's been time that you guys have a light and run with it. So I just wanted to say that. All right, thank you so much. Um, all right, you each gonna get 30 seconds. This is your uh, goodbye or final commentary, final comments. Um, and then we will wrap up and go from there because apparently there's an important hockey game on tonight. <laughs> I'm joking. All right, so what do you got? Who wants to go first? You got 30 seconds. Take it away. Muted. All right. Okay. For, okay. Uh, again, thank you, Ardavan, for inviting me to this wonderful, wonderful experience. Wow. Um, being amongst these great ladies and just a beautiful audience who was attentive and you know just supporting us and i'm pretty sure from what you learned today you're gonna share you know um your experience and i don't know i just kind of feel like it's gonna kind of spark something in you and a lot of you i don't know i have a feeling that you're gonna talk about this and that's what we need we need to have conversations and bring this to the forefront so again thank you very much um, if you would like to reach out to me and we can converse, you feel free. Artivan will send you all that information. And yeah, everybody take care and bless. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for coming to attend, but Artivan, the work that you're doing um, and not just this one time, but the series, and I've been in attendance on some of your other ones. It's it's amazing. And so continue to lead. Um, we need more of this. And thank you, uh, ladies, for this dialogue. It's been wonderful. Yeah, I agree with Krista. Um, I think what you're doing, Artivan, is uh, timely and also um, much needed. And uh, thank you to the people who came today to uh, listen. And it was so great to meet uh all of you um today so thanks for having me all right echo everybody artivan thank you for your continued work um and just a reminder everyone that changes start small smart starts with your circle like you don't have to tackle the whole world change the perception of the your family your community um, make change there starts with you like i said before and it's continued work. It's not because you came on one Zoom call or it's not because you went to one basketball game or um, you corrected someone one time. Language matters, um, continual action matters. Um, and start small, we can change the world together. Thanks. Um, first off, I just want to thank you, Artivan. This was amazing. I'm so happy that you contacted me to be with these amazing, amazing women. Um, you know how much you. work you want to chase all of you done. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone who's here, you know, listening, open ears. Um, I just hope that the change that is necessary occurs. Um, us women, we deserve so much better um, in every aspect. Um, but yeah, I just hope I cross paths with all of you again. You guys are amazing. Um, go women. And watch us at the Olympics. Cheer for us at the Olympics. <laughs> oh, yeah. Watch the Olympics and the Paralympics. And the Paralympics. <laughs> All right. On that note, 802, we went over time two minutes, but thank you for your patience. Enjoy the night wherever you are. And uh, thank you for coming and look for the next event in uh, July and August. All right. Thank you, everyone. And I'll be in touch with the panelists. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Bye.